You know why we're here today and why I'm so glad you're here today? What separates us from every other religion that's out there of do this and you might make it is what he did for us because he didn't just finish on the cross. He was buried three days later. He came up again. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I'm so glad to see it. It's just a blessing to have all of you here. Today's Terry Munro's spiritual birthday. She was saved on Easter when she was about three years old in 1981, I think. <laughs> That's a blessing. Every Easter you think about that. The St. Clairs are with us from way up north in snow country. They have continued to remain in touch with us and he's been in and out of the hospital and she's played nursemaid and they're here with us today and it's a blessing as well as to see so many others of you here, friends and family and visitors and those kind of things. I want to come at this a little differently. Last year we spent some time talking about the crucifixion. I find that there are three necessary parts to the gospel. And one of the parts that we oftentimes leave out is we talk about the death, the crucifixion, and we should. That's a, a very important, very vital part. But it doesn't stop at the cross. If all you get is the cross, you didn't get the full gospel. You can't preach a full gospel without the burial and then the resurrection, as Brother Sam so aptly pointed out to you during the song service. We serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. I know that He is living. That's what we're here today. That's what separates us from every other prophet, every other religion out there that has come around. Our Savior came up, and we believe that by faith. And can I say this? If He did not come up, there honestly is no point in us being here today. We really just as well hide eggs and put on a bunny suit or whatever. Whoever thought that, this shows you how stupid people are, that eggs came from bunnies. But they can market pretty much anything nowadays. And so, you know, it's kind of like, hey, all we have to do is, is put it in front of the people and they'll lap it up like it's good for them. But I'm not here to talk to you about bunnies and eggs today. Because this day, although it may be called Easter and the rest of the world, for me, it is Resurrection Sunday. Right. It's a day that I commemorate the day the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. came up from the ground made good His promise after He said a number of times in the Old and the New Testament that He was going to be down for three days and then come up again. And as a result, I know He's not a liar. Many people died on the crosses and many people died and suffered horrible martyrs' death at stakes and were burned and tortured and those kind of things, but not a single one of them came back up again. Look, if you will, please, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, read you just a few verses here, and then we're going to kind of walk through the Bible. It might seem a little bit more like a Bible study than a preaching sermon, but I, I think it is imperative that you understand this key ingredient in the gospel. And the reason is, is because if it was mentioned once, it would be important, but if it's mentioned literally dozens of times... It must be the key ingredient in the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, starting in verse number 12. Now if, it's a big if, it's the greatest if in the Bible. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Notice there's no argument about the crucifixion. The argument with the Sadducees and the Pharisees is always over, you're telling me somebody came up from the dead. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. That's the linchpin. That's the cotter key. That's the main ingredient. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. And your faith is also vain. I mean, it's worthless. It doesn't amount to anything. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ. Notice right back to the resurrection. Whom He raised not up, if so be, that the dead rise not. And if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, 
your faith is vain. And ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Brother Hakov, the good looking. Ask the Lord to bless the message, would you please? Amen. That's a good prayer. As you're being seated, would you please turn to Acts chapter number 1. We're going to do a little Bible study. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew in front of you. And if you don't want to do that, just look on with somebody that's around you. So as not to distract from, to take away from, subtract from the cross at Calvary, let me just say the cross is a necessary part of the gospel. Without Jesus dying on the cross and shedding His blood, for without the shedding of blood there is no remission, without that first ingredient, it doesn't make any difference about the second ingredient. If He rose again, but He did not die on the cross for our sins, according to the Scripture, then buried and raised again the third day, the resurrection would not matter. It would simply be like Lazarus coming up from the grave, the widow of Nain's son coming up from the grave, other people that were raised from the dead again to brought back to life only to die once again. So the key ingredient is, is Calvary is a very important part. If you're here today and you're not saved, saved for us means you know where you're going when you die. Not a question about where you're going. These people in here, if you were to look at all of our lives, you might look at us and say, hey, there's no way they could be saved. I see how they live. We are not saved by how we live. We are saved because we trusted what somebody has already done for us. And salvation is more than just believing that He died for your sins. That is simply one part of the gospel. He died for our sins. He shed His blood for our sins. As horrible as that crucifixion was, it is not the only ingredient of the gospel. And too often we spend a lot of time there talking about just the fact that Jesus died for our sins. But Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 at the beginning of this passage and 58 verses following are all about the resurrection as if that is the keynote, that is the most important thing and yet we spend a lot of time talking about the crucifixion. As I began to prepare this and look at it, I began to think to myself, it is much like the Christian life today. We spend all of our time dealing with the negative side all the time. The crucifixion, 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 the crucifixion. We talk about the crosses in our life. Sometimes the cross in your life might be sitting next to you. Don't say amen to that later. You can send me something later on that says amen to that, but don't say it right now. The Lord said, take up your cross, and maybe when you first got married, it might have been easier to take her up than it is now. Not because she's heavier, but because you've gotten older. Wow. And he's off to a great start. Sometimes your cross can be your work, your job, because without that job to kind of knock the luster off of you, you might be proud and boastful and arrogant. Sometimes it can be a physical abnormality. Sometimes it can be some problem. Sometimes it can be kids. They can be right down the hall from you and driving you insane, feeling like you're on a cross. Yeah. Amen. You say, not mine. Wait a while. They're not grown yet. Sometimes it can be grandkids. Thank you, I'll take you to dinner. Appreciate that. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, let me say this to you, not to be harsh or to be mean, but there's a whole lot more to Jesus Christ than just crosses. Amen. 
while I appreciate so much that Jesus died for my sins, He doesn't end on a negative note. And while I am not for being positive all the time, I do have a tendency to gravitate toward, to lean toward the negative more than I do the positive. While it is not our job to ride every charismatic ship who does nothing but the positive, we could learn a lesson to be a little bit more positive. I submit to you today, it is a positive thing that Jesus Christ came up from the grave. Amen. Amen. Those two are on the road to Emmaus over there and the Lord shows up and He says, Whoa, sad and slow of heart. What are you mully grubbing about? They're like, you haven't heard? And he said, heard what? He heard. He was there. Amen. Heard what? What y'all talking about? No, I don't even know. Oh. Oh. He's dead. And he's like, no, he ain't. He's right here. Amen. Didn't you hear what he said? Amen. That death was part of it. But don't you remember that he told you? three? Did you miss the positive part of the message? Oh. Did you miss that if he hadn't gone, you would still be lost in your sin? That you would still die and never be resurrected? You would go to hell? You would burn? Did you miss the positive part that he sealed on that day that he came up out of the grave? The final say-so of, hey, it is finished. The work is done. Now, three days later, I'm coming up. And it's a positive thing. I don't know about you, but... Easter time really should be a time of celebration. I mean, we have the Lord's Supper and that's good. Remember His death, but, but, but till He comes. It's not we just remember He died, but we also remember He's coming back. Well, He can't come back if He's not alive. And I just want to say to you that I'm trying my best to retrain my mind to stop focusing on my historical crosses. I can go into my closet for the last 20 years and pull out historical crosses in my life. And the Lord said, that's great. Can you cross-reference that to 20 years of resurrections in your life? Can you cross-reference that with for everything you saw was negative? Can you show all things work together for good, them love God, them are called according to His purpose? Can you show them the resurrection after that cross? Can you show them the newness over here after the oldness is gone over here? Can we talk today a little bit about the positive side of Jesus? I'm not going to hell. If you are, you're an idiot. So I never heard a preacher. You ain't never heard a preacher. You're an idiot. You'll be called damned. You'll be called cursed. Maybe the Lord will be up there and go, I don't know. I never thought, what is the word idiot in Hebrew? I don't know, but you're an idiot. You're going to hell. Why? Because you chose to reject Jesus Christ. Finish work on Calvary and coming out of the tomb. The tomb is a key ingredient, but you know, we're just so bound to make things so bad. We get so much more attention when we're negative than we do when we're positive. We draw so much more people looking at us and, oh, it's so bad. But can I ask you this question? Let's be honest. What is it in life that testifies greater of Him? The crucifixion or the resurrection? What is it that lifts Jesus Christ higher? His crucifixion or His resurrection? He raised Himself from the grave. But unless we get carried away, let's just see if it's in the Bible anywhere. Because I can find the crucifixion. Four times in four Gospels, He talks about Calvary. In Isaiah 53, He talks about Calvary. But I just got to thumbing through the Bible and I find this to start off with Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 21 and 22. They're looking for somebody to take the place of Judas. 
Judas has betrayed and he's already burst asunder and gone down to the pit. Now remember the Lord said he's going to Jerusalem to suffer, to be killed and raised the third day. He says in Matthew chapter number 12 that Jonas was in the belly of the well three days and three nights. So shall the Son of Man be where? In the heart of the earth. You say, where was he? In the heart of the earth. He didn't swoon. He didn't pass out. His body wasn't stolen. His body was up there in the tomb and he was down in the heart of the earth just like he said he would be. Because he had a date with time. John chapter number 2 says he'll destroy the temple and in three days he'll raise it up again. John chapter number 10, I lay down my life. No man takes it from me and I take it up again. John chapter number 11, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Where was Jesus' emphasis? It was on his resurrection. He didn't go around having a pity party all the time. I'm going to Calvary. I'm going to die. Oh, it's going to be terrible. No, that Bible says that when he was in that valley of decision in the Garden of Gethsemane, that Bible said when great sweat drops of blood were poured off of him, that he set his face like a flint for the joy that was set before him. He said, hey, it don't stop with me on the cross. It's the starting place, the ending place as I come up out of the ground. And because I'm resurrected, you'll be resurrected also. You never see the Lord having a pity party. He never says, woe is me. Even when Peter jumps in the way and says, not so, Lord. The Lord says, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm going to die so I can experience a resurrection. That's what baptism is like for us. Buried with Him and raised again the newness of life. He's the great picture of that. He's excited about resurrecting Himself more than He is about dying for our sins. Acts chapter number 1, I'm trying to get there. They're looking for a replacement. Verse 21, Wherefore these men which have company with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in out among us. Now, they're looking for a replacement of an apostle. So you have to find out if you think there's any apostles today. I'll show you. Beginning from the baptism of John. Well, there goes all your apostolic people today because they weren't here when John was baptizing. Unto the same day that he was taken up from us, ascension, they had to have seen him rise. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of one of the qualifications of being an apostle is not also a shantai, untie, a bow tie, economy, Honda. It is not knocking somebody over backwards or handling a snake or calling yourself an apostle or a chief apostle or some kind of sub apostle or whatever. An apostle had to have been there when John was baptizing, had to have been there and watched the Lord ascend, and also had to have seen the resurrected Lord. You say, but what about the Apostle Paul? He saw the resurrected Lord on the road to Damascus. Now let me ask you a question. If it's a requirement for the, uh, for the apostles, don't you think it's something important? Look in Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2, look in verse number 22. You can't preach the full gospel without the resurrection. The Apostle Paul said how that Christ died for your sins, 1 Corinthians 15, was buried and raised again the third day according to the scripture. So there must be some scripture in there that has to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why are you preaching the resurrection preacher? Not just because it's Easter or Resurrection Sunday or whatever day you want to call it. Listen, I'm not worried about my relationship with the Lord getting messed up because of a bunny and an egg. Or because somebody is saying it's Ishtar's day. It ain't Ishtar's day for me. This is the Lord's day for me. I'm not worshiping Ishtar, Eastar, or anybody else's tar. I'm worshiping Jesus Christ this morning, and I'm enjoying Him. And just because they take it and abuse it or don't know any better but to do that because nobody's ever taught them, all they've ever done is kick them and tear their bunnies off their, their ears off their chocolate bunnies. Nobody's ever said, hey, there's more to this day than just eggs and bunnies. Hey, there's more than just putting on a fancy suit and putting on some foo-foo juice. There's more than just going to dinner with family. This is the day we commemorate the greatest event in history. Jesus Christ arose. And they're like, what? Yeah, and he didn't have on a bunny suit. 
What do you expect? They're lost. They don't know any better. They just do what is tradition. They were raised in families with baskets and eggs and but They don't know. But you know what? We spend so much time knocking it down and not enough time talking about the other side. I say just show them the resurrection. If they don't bite that bait, something's wrong with the fish. Acts chapter number 2. Verse number 22, i got to hurry. i got about a hundred of these. Amen. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by the miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you. As ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Period. No. There's a colon there, and I'm not an English major, but I know enough to say that means you don't stop the thought. We're continuing the thought. It's a little more emphasis than a pause or a comma. It's don't lose the thought that there's more to this story. Colon, watch, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Well, isn't that interesting that he goes into the book of Acts and right off the bat he starts talking about it. Now he comes on down there in verse number 30. He says it again. Therefore being a prophet. Talking about David and his sepulcher and the Lord not leaving, his faith, leaving him down in hell. Verse number 30. Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with him an oath that the, of the fruit of his loins according to flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ. Amen. Peter's already preaching and he's preaching right after the death and burial and resurrection. He's not even preaching the whole message about crucifixion. He's mentioned in resurrection two and three times more than he's mentioned in the crucifixion. Are you seeing the picture? I hope not because I want to give you all these other passages. <laughs> Verse 32, this Jesus hath God raised up. Where we're all witnesses. Acts chapter number 3. Say how many of these? A bunch. It's just Bible. Verse number 14, But ye denied the holy and just desired a murderer to be granted unto you. That would be Barabbas. Killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof your witnesses. You ever read that passage over in Romans chapter number 10? That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Right? And believe in thine heart that God hath what? It's an element of your salvation or you're not saved. You've got to believe not just that He died for you, which we all talk about. You've got to believe He not only died for me, but He rose again the third day and have believed in your heart that God hath raised Him. Believing the resurrection is a key element in you being saved. Not just somebody died for your sins. That's true, but... They paid for it and then came back up. You know what the resurrection indicates? Paid for. Amen. Just like Brother Sam was trying to explain to you and trying to harness himself and not get too excited, his day will come where he gets to preach an Easter sermon. I'm sure these guys can't wait of every sermon anybody wants to preach it's on Easter. But he tried his best to say, hey, when the Lord died, he took our sins upon him, went down into hell, yeah. dropped those sins off. The resurrection proves that sin had no hold on him, could not keep him down there, could not restrain him, did not defile him. And when he came up, our sin was gone. Amen. Resurrection is proof of that, Brother Cliff. Amen. It's proof Amen. that the price has been paid. There's Amen. not a debt still owed. Amen. There's not a, hey, we got a little bit of interest, huh, treasure? We got a little interest that still needs to be paid on that. No, paid in full. Yeah. No little note saying, I promise to pay. Amen. Still got a few of those. Amen. They mean well, but they just hadn't quite their pocket, but hadn't caught up with their heart yet. They won't leave an IOU at the restaurant today or they'll be busting suds. That was a subtle way of saying, if you have an IOU, let your conscience be your God. Look, if you will, in Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4, 
This is the beginning, Brother Josh. This is where the gospel is starting to get out. Paul's gospel hadn't even come out. The Lord is now, the finished atonement has been done. And so the thing is beginning to come out now. You understand it? It's beginning to go. You haven't even gotten out of Acts chapter number 1 into Acts 2, Acts 3, and now Acts 4. And guess what's happening? They're talking about, hey, we serve a risen Savior, the guy you killed, accept responsibility, but he ain't dead no more. So, hey... Feel guilty all you want, but he's alive. Amen. You need to get saved. You say, why? Because he's alive. You can't keep whining over spilt milk. Accept the payment. How do I know? Because he came up. Amen. Verse number one, And he spake to the people, the priest, the captain, the temple, the Sadducees that came to them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. You say, what upset them? It wasn't the preaching of the cross. At this time, hundreds of Jews were being slain and killed on the cross. It was a topic of everyday conversation. Rome was moving through Israel and slaughtering Christians at an unbelievable rate. It was not unheard of for them to put Jews by the hundreds on crosses on a daily basis. That isn't what upset the religious people. They're in there saying, yeah, you crucified him, but let me tell you what happened. He came up after three days, and now they're mad. Amen. Look in Acts chapter number 4, continue on. Look in verse number 10. And the Bible says, Be it known unto all you and all people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God hath raised, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. You know what he said? He said, Listen, I'm telling you there's more to this thing than just the fact. Come down a little bit further. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 19. Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than unto God judge ye. For we cannot but speak of the things which we have seen and heard. What had they seen? They saw the resurrected Christ. They saw the Lord come in there in the Gospels and stand in front of them, Thomas being one of them, and saying, Come see me and handle me, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone. They saw him eat. They passed the taste test. Thomas touched him. He passed the touch test. They listened. The apostles saw him. They passed the sight test. Every sense that they had had been passed on. They witnesses to what happened. What happened? He's resurrected. Amen. Not just happenstance. It was a real bodily resurrection. It wasn't just a ghost that came up. A little bit further in Acts chapter number 4, look at verse number 32. Verse number 32. The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them which all these things he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And it's connected with great grace. And are you beginning to see that in the early days, Acts chapter number 5, are you beginning to see in the early days that as the apostles preached the crucifixion and what a horrible, terrible thing it was, a torture beyond anything we can possibly imagine, a physical demeaning and a putting down psychologically and spiritually of the person that was up there in an emaciated form, beaten beyond recognition, his visions barred more than any man. Everything about that thing was absolutely horrible. But instead of them focusing on how bad the torture was, they seemed to constantly be saying, yeah, there was a crucifixion, but, but it didn't stop there. Let me give you the positive side. The positive side is, he came up. The whip marks were gone. The nail prints were there, but they were healed. He came up in a new body that had not seen corruption. Acts chapter number 5, verse number 29. And Peter said to the other apostles and answered, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up. There it is again. Jesus. Oh, by the way, who ye slew and hanged on a tree. You've you got to get this just a second now. So it's real important how your King James Bible's written there. Peter would have been guilty of hanging him on the tree also. Is that right? Unless he had accepted the atonement. Now he's no longer guilty because his sins are put as far as the east is from the west. They're behind the Lord's back. They're remembered no more. They're in the depths of the sea. Peter said, y'all did it. I didn't do it. You say, yeah, Peter, you were there. You denied him under the blood. 
saved by a resurrected Savior. Y'all killed him. I'm saved. I, my sins are clear. I'm washed away. I'm pure as the driven snow. Why? I accepted what he did for me on Calvary and he came back up. You're guilty of it. You're still guilty of it. You're going to stand in judgment for it. That's what's going to put you in hell for it. But I'm not going to hell, Peter said, because I serve a risen Savior. And if you're lost today, if you don't accept that atonement, you have to pay for it yourself. And sin against man, you can pay for down here. And the sin against God, you have to pay for until God dies. And last time I checked, God doesn't die. A little, excuse me, a little further in the book of Acts there, he says this in verse number 31, And him of God had with exalted the right hand to be the prince of the Savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Heard what? That they were guilty. Heard they were responsible for the death. They didn't hear the positive side. They didn't hear the good side. You ever read 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4? That's one of your favorite passages. I learned it because Brad likes it. But you know what he says? He said, The Lord will bring those who sleep with Him. Right? But you know what he says in that passage? You have to believe not only in the death, but also in the resurrection. Or you don't get to come back. And you know what he says at the bottom of that thing? We sorrow not as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even him will God bring with him to be reunited with his body. I can't imagine a religion that doesn't know where loved ones go. I can't imagine that. I mean, I'd be ready to shoot myself. If I didn't have any hope of knowing, I can't imagine what it's like to stand over the grave of a, of a loved one and watch him go and not think, man, thank God they're saved. Amen. Amen. You might say a lot of things about a lot of people I know, but I know by their testimony they're saved. What matters when you die? Are you saved? Right. How do I get saved? Jesus Christ died for your sins. Amen. Buried, but he came up again the third day. You've got to have all three parts of that thing or you're not going to make it in. You know what he says? He, he goes through that passage right there. He says, listen, he, wherefore comfort one another. He says, we sorrow, but not as others have no hope. Why? We're not focusing on the death. We're not focusing on the sleep. We're not focusing on the crucifixion. We're focusing on after that they come up. Amen. Comfort one another, he says. Amen. Amen. Boy, it sure is hard sometimes. A little bit further, Acts chapter number 10. I think sometimes the reason that a lot of people don't follow, quote, our religion and don't want anything to do with our relationship is because we always focus. As one lady said to me, I was doing fine till I got saved. I mean, I tried to use all my theological wisdom on that one. I'm like, okay, how do you answer that one? That's a Nehemiah prayer. Oh, God, help. And that's not even time for oh, God. It's just help, like a little spider caught in the web. Fly. Help me. I said, why do you say that? She said, since I got saved, hell has opened its gates and unleashed the demons on me, and I've had nothing but misery. I said, could I ask you this question? Do you think you might have had misery even if you weren't saved? Are you blaming your salvation? Want to give it back? She goes, well, sometimes I think about it. I said, well, you can't because it's not yours. So you're going to heaven whether you like it or not. But the way you're going, it's going to be a rough trip. I said, I think I'd zip it. I said, what makes you think you wouldn't be having that trouble? Where do you get that? 
That comes from an individual who's blaming God for their trouble. Amen. And before they were saved, they wouldn't have opened their mouth. But now that they're saved, they have, well, this was God's fault. He should be taking better care of me than that. Suppose you're just reaping what you sow, ma'am or sir. Suppose God's just letting your chickens come home to roost. Suppose God's just letting you see what it costs for you to do what you did for a long time and somebody has to pay the price. Amen. Suppose God's more lenient and more just than you give Him credit to being. Suppose He's more gracious than you want Him to be. Suppose He's not putting on you what He could justifiably put on you and answer to Himself when He got to heaven and say, Hey, let me tell you something. If I really unleashed the hounds of hell on you, I wouldn't have to clear my throat. The wages of sin is death. My grace keeps you safe. My grace walks with you through that. My grace is sufficient for you. Why are you questioning me? I paid the price, yes. I resurrected, yes. Don't be blaming me for your foolishness. Just saying. Fellow said one time, I got cancer. I said, I'm sorry, I really am. He said, I wonder why God would do this. And I said, why do you think it's God? I said, son, since I have known you, all the days of being a policeman, I have known you. You have been sucking on coffin nails. God didn't do that to you. He didn't make you go buy them things and suck on them. You did that to yourself. Amen. What's my family going to do? You should have thought about that before you went to sucking cigarettes. Amen. I don't care if you smoke them. But don't be blaming God when you come down with cancer. Amen. I don't care if you drink it. Oh good, here we go. Smoke them if you got them and drink it if you got it. And all that kind of stuff. You're not that wicked. But I'm not going to come in your cabinet or go sit in your car see what radio station you're listening to or look in your cabinet to see whether or not you do or don't or step in there and smell all the free breeze in there that they try to tell you take cigarette smoke out of your car. It don't. You still smell like it. <laughs> but that don't make you a good Christian whether you do it or don't do it. But don't be blaming God when if you keep sowing to the flesh you reap corruption. Some of you are going to eat yourself into a grave faster than somebody's going to smoke theirself into theirs. Put that one on for size. Amen. Man, preacher, see, y'all like it when I kick somebody to smoke a cigarette. When I talk about you, how about this? Some of you, your tongue is so long you're going to find yourself hanging from it in a closet one day because your gossip is going to wind up doing more damage to you than anybody will ever do with a cigarette or a glass of liquor. That's in here somewhere. We're talking about the positivity of the resurrection. Bring it out. That was almost like a black preacher. Positivity. I think. Acts chapter number 10. Y'all get real nervous here. Y'all are like... Don't be nervous. It's okay. We only got a couple more hours and then you can go eat. You say, what happens? Well, look, if you're around here, here's what we do. We stay long enough so that everybody else is already gone. Then you get great service when you walk in. Because when you walk in the door, you think everybody's supposed to bow anyway. So they already bust the tables and they got everything cleaned up. It's like, hey, we've been waiting for you to get here to have a party. We're just so glad you're here. And now you can have the whole restaurant because you didn't get here at 4 o'clock. What church do you go to? The church of the loud and the long. Acts chapter number 10, verse 39, trying to hurry. And we are witnesses of all things which we, he did both in the land of Jews, in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hung on a tree. There's another one of them coals. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose yes, from the dead. Yes, right, right. Pete don't even know what he's doing. Pete's preaching to Cornelius, who is a Gentile. 
He just gave you the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and that is not what Peter had been preaching. Peter had been preaching, repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, you shall receive the Holy Ghost. He just goes through and just giving an outward testimony, and two times after the crucifixion, he says, resurrection, resurrection, he just gave him the gospel. Because he's talking to Gentiles, and Paul hasn't even been officially called out yet. He's been met on the road to Damascus. Speaking of Paul, let's see if there's a couple of things here in the book of... Acts chapter number 13, the Apostle Paul. Just a few of these and then we'll go to the barn, I promise. A few for me is... It's in the way that you view the subject. If it's a few donuts, you're hoping that it's a dozen. If it's a few Brussels sprouts... You're hoping it is no more than three. (laughs) So it's all how you view it. Acts chapter number 13, verse 26. Is this helping you at all? Men and brethren, children, thank you. Made me feel so warm. Children of the stock of Abraham, whosoever among you feareth God. We're in verse 26. To you in the word of salvation sent. Dwell at Jerusalem, the rulers, because they knew him not nor yet the voices of the prophets and read the Sabbath day have fulfilled them condemning him. We're in Acts chapter number 13. We're in verse number 28. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the sepulcher. But, but God raised him from the dead. They did all they were going to do. And God knew everything they were going to do. But there was one thing they couldn't do. And so when they got done, and Jesus said, it's finished, God said, get up. The third day. That's them beginning to have contentions now that are coming up. And that's the Apostle Paul preaching. Look in the same verse, chapter number, or verse number 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, and has written the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. He goes on down there and talks about, in verse number 37, whom God hath raised again, and saw no corruption. Are you beginning to see that the resurrection is an important part of the scripture? I'm not quite done yet. Come to Acts 17. We're almost done, though. We're not even out of the book of Acts. Ten to one over the crucifixion. I like telling the story of the crucifixion. I think it paints a graphic story. Sometimes I spend so long talking about the crucifixion, and then I put a little 20-second tag on the end, and oh yeah, by the way, he resurrected. But if we do it the biblical way, we should talk about the crucifixion, but we should talk twice as much about the resurrection. Because our hope is in the resurrection. See, See, here's what he's trying to get across to you. If you kick off before he comes... Your hope is in that he got up. Because if he didn't get up, as I read to you in 1 Corinthians 15, what good is it? Because if he didn't get up, you ain't getting up. If he didn't get up, those that have gone on before you ain't getting up. They already up, by the way. Just not in their body yet. Acts chapter number 17, now they lead past the Amphipolis, whatever. The amphibious assault there. Amphipolis and Apollonia. And they came to Thessalonica where the synagogue of the Jews and Paul, as his manner was, went in with them. Three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered. Three days he's arguing with them and rise again from the dead. And some wind up believing and some don't. Look at verse number 17. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons in the market daily and them that met with him and certain the philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him saying, uh, some said, what will this babbler say? And others said, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange God. Be- why? Because he preached unto them Jesus Amen. and the resurrection. 
They said, something's wrong with Paul. He's not talking all heady and high-minded. He's not talking all intellectual. He's not talking all smart. He's not talking all practical. He's not giving us all this uh, stuff on a marriage seminar and giving us stuff on financial security. He's not telling us how to be blessed and how to be happy. He's preaching the audacity of him being in church and preaching Jesus and the resurrection. That wouldn't fit in most churches nowadays. To just preach Jesus and the resurrection, most people won't come to church for that. Preach the headlines. Preach something that's going on in the prophetic world. Give us some eschatology. Tell us what's going to happen next. You're going to die. Someday. And you better make the decision now to cover that when it happens. A couple of more here. Verse number 30. Same passage in 17. In times of ignorance, God winked at. But now commendeth, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Isn't that interesting? Your assurance comes in the fact that he got up. It doesn't come in just knowing about the crucifixion. It comes in the fact that you know that he got up from it. Acts chapter number 26 and then we're going to move into Romans. And then Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, and Thessalonians. And then Timothy, and Titus, and Philemon. Hebrews, and James, and 1st, and 2nd, and 3rd John. And Revelation. Did you ever see those passages in Revelation anyway? Worthy is the Lamb. That wast, W-A-S-T, wast slain. Had been slain, past tense. Not anymore. Why, do they do? why is he worthy? Because he came up. That's why he's worthy. Worthy as a lamb because he's pure and perfect and holy. Yeah, he's all that too. But he died, was buried, he was slain. What are they making reference to? That's in Revelation 5. They're making reference to him coming up. When he introduces himself to John, he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. What? That's a big name. He doesn't say I'm the crucified and the life. I'm not making light of the crucifixion. I'm saying without the resurrection, he's just crucified. Amen. You've got to have the resurrection to be a part of that. Uh, Acts chapter number 26, if you're there, verse number 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, now, of all the things to say, Paul's on trial. He's got a lawyer's license. He's not stupid. Trained at the feet of Gamil. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disappointed in the heavenly vision that showed first unto them that Damascus and Jerusalem throughout the coast of Judea and the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophet Moses did say. Verse number 23, that Christ should suffer and should be the first that should rise from the dead Amen. and would show unto the people and the Gentiles. Do you understand the, what he's saying? Paul's in front of the King Agrippa, the guy that has the power to say, you're nuts, you're wacko, you, you know, put you in the same asylum, go ahead and have you killed. What He's on trial. <coughs> King Agrippa would have no problem at all believing somebody died and suffered as a martyr. Many Christian martyrs, many Jewish martyrs in those days, he would have no problem at all. But then for Paul to put on that, on the end of that, and to say, and he rose again, now, now, now you'll find out why Pelix goes, Paul, you're mad. Not, Paul, you're mad because you were happy when you came out of prison. Paul, you're mad because you met the Lord on the road. Many people had had visions in those days. They didn't have a completed revelation of the Bible. Somebody having a vision wasn't unusual for that to happen. It wasn't that. It wasn't that Paul had been tortured or been in prison or had been a misfit with the people around there. That was not uncommon. They all the time had judicial battles and courtroom scenes on a regular basis to determine the right and wrong of the religious people. But this one comes up and says one thing that sets him apart from everybody else. Hey, this same one that crucified. Yeah, we got that. He's a Jew. He's supposed to be crucified. He's a martyr. He's causing trouble and problems and so on and so forth. And he's turning this whole place upside down. And so we do that because he's coming against insurrection, against the government. And Paul said, yeah, that's that same guy that rose again. Amen. And they said, this guy's nuts. 
He speaks like a lawyer. He talks like he's got some sense. But then he has to talk like somebody's around here rose from the dead. Have you ever heard? What a stupid thing. If you don't believe he rose again, then you're not saved. <laughs> Philippians chapter number 3. Let me skip over all these ones in the book of Romans. There's a dozen of them. You just come to the book of Philippians. I think you're beginning to see the picture, are you not? Amen. I like it when the Bible to me is fresh. You pick up the Bible and want to preach on the crucifixion. And the Lord said, how about my resurrection? Yeah, there's that too. Yeah, but how about my resurrection? Amen. Amen. You start looking up raised, and you start looking up raised, and you start looking up resurrection. And man, all of a sudden you begin to see, good night. And therein lies modern Christian philosophy. Yes. Give me just a second. The devil doesn't care if you talk about the crucifixion. He don't care. He don't want you talking about the resurrection. He doesn't care if you just give him a one-third or even a two-third. He died and was buried. Talk about how horrible, how bloody. Talk about it was just terrible. The cat of nine tails and the ribbons of flesh dangling from him and the bulls of Bashan surrounding him and his bones being out of joint, not broken. Talk about the sweat and the spit. Talk about the bugs. Talk about oh, how terrible it was. His nakedness, his shame and all that. Yeah, talk about that and really blow on those negative embers. Just don't say. That's not the end of the story. And most Christians, we don't want to look at, I'm going to heaven one day and get a glorified body. I bet you'd appreciate that. A glorified body? Walk around without a wheelchair? Eyes to be able to see? A back that's straight and doesn't hurt? I bet that it would be an exciting thing if we were in that position to say, man, I'm looking forward to the day when I get up and get out. Amen. Let me out of this prison cell. Yes, sir. We spend so much time complaining and we don't have anything to complain about. Man, we walk around like this is terrible and I got up this morning and not as fast. Drina's been making me walk. She says, I'm getting fat. So I've been walking like five miles every day. Little run, little walk. Little run. Little walk. Get up and it's like, ah, ah. Zeke looking at me like, what is wrong with you? I'm old. You, you're still kicking, man. But I got up. Nobody had to come get me up. I walked down the stairs and I turned on the coffee pot. I could smell it cooking. I walked outside and I was going to look for the blood. It was cloudy. But I could see that it was cloudy. I turned around and looked back at my house and I said, I got a place to live. Man. Amen. The Lord just kind of said, Why are you always focusing on all the negative? What's today? I said, Lord, this is three days after you were crucified. He said, No! It's the first day I came out of the tomb. Amen. My finished work is the resurrection. Yes, you got to have the crucifixion. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just talk about it all the time. Not even him. He doesn't say on the road to Emmaus, Hey guys, that was me, boy. They beat the snot out of me. You should have seen what you couldn't see, all them demons around me. Man, they took me back in that dark room. 
Man, when that whip came down there singing the world's saddest song, my blood was flying everywhere. I was looking around. I was deserted. None of you guys was nowhere to... Man, it was bad. No, he doesn't say that. He says, how come y'all are so sad and slow of heart? Didn't that same God tell you he was going to get up? Yeah. Amen. I said, you know, he said, you know what? I think we ought to have something to eat. They said, well, well, would you hang out with us? He said, sure. He said, what you got? We got a little bit of bread. He said, oh, man, I can't be around bread without breaking it, without blessing it. They got ready to eat. The Lord said, hang on just one second. Let's thank God we got something to eat. Amen. By now, I'm smelling eggs and some kind of special meat stuff cooking in the pan. Somebody's making breakfast for me. And the Lord said, miss a meal lately? Got it bad, do you? Things are tough. Father, we sure do appreciate this bread. It's nice to meet these two boys on the road here and this fellow they've been talking about. I pray you bless him. Maybe he tore that thing off. Not in three pieces. He said, here, boys, I have meat, you know, not all. He hands one piece over here and one piece over here. And then boys said, oh, we know who that was. Did not our hearts burn within us when we got our eyes off of our sadness and started looking at his gladness? Amen. They saw the resurrected Lord. You see what they do? They went, oh. It's great he was resurrected, but man, what a crucifixion. Yeah. Mm, no. no. They went back and said, we saw him, we saw him, we saw him. You, you, I mean, surely you guys know he said he's coming up third day. We never doubted him at all. We saw him. How did you know it was him? second he grabbed that bread and blessed it, we yes. knew who that was. Yes. That was none other than Jesus. He was alive. Yes. They said, you lie. About that time, the Lord shows up and says, what'd you say? And they're like. <laughs> Apostle Paul says in Philippians, and I'm done, that I might know him, the fellowship of his sufferings. But watch it. What does he end with? The power of his resurrection. We focus so much on the suffering. Like we're some great martyr. Like they're going to chain us to a pole and burn us. Like, man, we're just going through such things. And I'm thinking, honestly, really, if I had to meet those people today, I couldn't say anything. These are people that had their kids taken from them. Had them tortured in front of them. Encouraging their kids in Fox's Book of Martyrs. Don't deny the Lord. He'll take care of you. See you on the other side. Amen. Writing letters to those that are incarcerated. Don't deny Him. Walk up on the porch, blow a Christian's head off, takes the bits of the brain and the skull, puts them in the lap of the woman who is crying and says, what do you think of your fair husband now? She said he's more beautiful now than he's ever been before. In heaven with a crown. So for me, New Year's resolution starts for me on Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Not New Year's Day. No, no. Resurrection Day. Amen. And my resurrection resolution is I'm going to start trying to look at more resurrections in my life than crucifixions in my life. Amen. It's Easter. Yay! Amen. Why? Because of chocolate bunnies? No! Because he came out! Amen. So I could get in! Yeah. Oh, that's almost good! Yeah. And they come to the tomb. He ain't in there. The angel says, he's a southern angel. What in the cat hair are you doing here? Can you learn nothing walking with him? Putting your nose where it don't belong? What you doing in here? 
Don't you know he's risen? Yeah, whatever. And they go back. Mary stays. And she don't believe. Where have you taken the body? And he shows up. He'd been up for quite some time. Hey, what you looking for? Hey, how are you, you the gardener? Where, where are you taking them? The sorrow of the crucifixion and death blinded her from the glory that was right in front of her. Mm -hmm. Good. She couldn't appreciate because right. she couldn't recognize standing right in front of her mm -hmm. the resurrected Lord. He stands off for a minute. Probably puts his arms up like this and says, Mary. Oh boy. I heard that voice before. He has a way he calls my name. She reaches out to grab him. He said, Don't touch me yet. I have not yet ascended. Peacock ad lib. I thought so much of you to come by and comfort you in your sorrow, let you know everything's going to be okay before I went to see him. And I've been gone from him a whole lot longer than I've been gone from you. I've only been gone from you three days. I've been gone from up in eternity for 33 years. Mary, you matter. So Mary went back and said, Guys, I've got to tell you, I saw the crucified Lord. That's not what they say. I saw the resurrected Lord. I, I spoke to him. He talked to me. Man, you wouldn't believe it. What a blessing. I couldn't appreciate him now. Hadn't it been for what I saw him go through. But now. Yeah. So what does Mary do? She goes around and tells everybody, he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Guess what? The message is still the same. Amen. We need to stop putting him back on the cross. Right. Amen. He's alive. Amen. Amen. I don't always acknowledge it like I should, but he's alive in my life every day. Yeah. Amen. He's Amen. working with me yeah. every day. Amen. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We serve a risen Savior. Yes, right. We have nothing to complain about. You're going home soon, I hope. Amen. Oh, I hope soon. I've had enough. Amen. Blow the horn. Yeah. I got one great baby, great grandbaby here and one on the way. Say, well, what about him? I said, just soon them go up. Amen. Amen. I'm naming one of them revenge and one of them something else. I don't know what the other one's going to be yet. Can we change our mindset a little bit this Lord's Day? We come together today to have the Lord's Supper. Can we be reverent and appreciate that He died for our sins? But can we rejoice over the fact that He didn't stay dead? Amen. Amen. And focus maybe a little more than we have on the positive went home one day. Amen. Nothing you have going on in your life right now wouldn't be fixed by the rapture. Amen. One step further, nothing you have going on in your life right now wouldn't be fixed if you're saved by you dying. Amen. For a Christian, when we die, it's like, yes! Yes. Right. Amen. Hallelujah! You're like, no, yeah! Amen. Then we really start living. We're not carrying around a boat anchor anymore. Amen. You talk about free, man. But if you're lost, man, that's the beginning of eternal torment for you. 
from which there is no relief. Burning in literal hell forever. But I get to think about the positive. I'm not going there. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Miss Pat, just a couple of verses. God spoke to you, you'd like to come. It's not really an invitation kind of a thing. It is for salvation. Brother Burt prayed right before the service began and said, Lord, if there's anybody that's here today that's lost, let today be the day they get saved. Easter is a great day to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's always commemorated. And so you would never have a hard time remembering your anniversary. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, could you put aside your petty problems, differences, difficulties, hypocrites in the church, gossipers, all the other stuff you can't stand about church people, and look at Jesus for just a minute. And remember that, number one, He died for your sins, according to the Scriptures. Number two, He was buried. His body stayed in that tomb for three days. He went and preached to the spirits in prison, then went over to paradise, Abraham's bosom, and preached over there for a little while, and then on the third day he rose again according to the Scripture. And if you believe that you're a sinner, not confessing your sin, but if you'll admit you're a sinner, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and confess Him as your Savior, He'll save you today. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Just a couple of standards.